Let's see if I can share my screen. Okay. okay, and I think this is about where we left off. Okay. All right, so bop in if you have questions, but um, this is where I think things started to, um, you know, kind of get crazy um, with my internet. So hopefully we'll just pick up. But um, in utero, when the fetus is developing, initially it's a lot of, um, it's mostly cartilage. Um, I'm gonna see if I can pull up actually, I'm gonna, get out of this screen for a second and see if you can um can you see these pictures shared on your screen okay so what we're looking at here is um and i don't know hopefully you can see this okay but this is what it would look like a lot of times they come in and um, and I want to say it's around, um, normally it's a 63, 64 day um, gestation period from the time they get pregnant till they give birth. And around 32 days-ish um, is when we can usually start to see some skeletal development. So on x-ray, the bones all here, so those are vertebrae up there, those are ribs, but you can see the skeletal development here. And like there's a skull, there is a skull, there is a skull. So we'll usually count skulls and try to tell the owner how many puppies to um, expect. Now, the other thing to show is, and hopefully you can see this, this is an x-ray of a puppy. Um, and what you can see here, it kind of looks like they're all in pieces. Um, like all these bones are just like, if we look at this x-ray, um, you can see that's a long bone and they're all connected. That's when all the bones grow to their full length. But in here, when you have a puppy radiograph, it looks like they're all kind of like there's a big gap. Now, that's all connected with connective tissue. It's just that those bones haven't reached their full length. So they, and you can see in the tail especially, they look like they're little pieces. Those eventually are gonna lengthen and then they're gonna look like they're all connected. Um, here is an x-ray and hopefully, oh, this is a better picture. Here is one that's almost fully grown. Um, you can see there's the pelvis. And if you look right here, it looks like there's a line, okay? And it looks like there's a gap here and a gap here. And right here, okay, this is the femur this down here is the tibia and you there's like a line it looks like there's two pieces well this piece up here is the epiphysis that's the proximal epiphysis this is the diaphysis and that is the growth plate that is two plates of cartilage and that bottom part of the bone is going to eventually layer us the osteoblasts are going to layer 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 and then that will close and again when those growth plates close um, is when the dog reaches skeletal maturity and they completely ossify. And again, um, larger breeds, that's going to be 18 months to two years old. In the smaller breeds, it's going to be somewhere from the 12 to 18 months. So um, like I said, I'm giving an orthopedic lecture now in my other class, and we're talking about when to do hip x-rays. Um, and they usually will not do that until they're two years old because most dogs by two years old should have reached their skeletal maturity. So I just wanted to show um, some of those x-rays to show you what I was you know, actually talking about. Because what you're looking at here is that epiphyseal plate. Now, right here, it's fused. But if you can imagine if this was an immature bone, there would be a gap right there where it seals. Okay, so the bone starts out 
as cartilage um, and then it's going to eventually um, ossify and become a complete bone. Yeah, and I will mention, I don't want to get too far on another topic, but um, we can diagnose hip dysplasia younger than two years of age. I mean, in, in severe, severe cases, I mean, I saw a um, Bernese mountain dog that was six months old that had awful hips. But normally, in mild to medium cases, they want to see them grow a little bit because they can somewhat... You know, they want that bone to grow and the muscles to mature to really see how severe the hip dysplasia is. So, you know, maybe after class we can talk about, you know, Ireland's dog. But, um, you know, my dog had some radiographs when he was about one and a half of his back. And we could see that the hip was not quite in place. But he had a mild form um, and he never... Um, you know, talked about it. So, yeah. You know, and at one years old, that would be a very aggressive therapy to do a total hip at that age, um, but it can be done. Um, I've usually seen total hips done when they're a little bit older, um, but certainly there are options. But, so I just want you to know, eventually that bone will reach maturity. Um, these are the bones that they all have names um, for their shapes. And so this is a long bone. And these are typically found in the limbs. This is actually a cow femur. I would normally pass it around in class, but you can see that it's long. Um, and most, like I said, most of the, long, the bones in the appendicular skeleton or the appendages are made up of long bones. Femur, humerus, tibia, fibula, radius ulna are typically our long bones. Um, I have an example of a flat bone, and this is actually a scapula. So this would be the bone in your shoulder, okay? So the point right here, this is the acrimonium of the scapula, and the head of the humerus would fit in there, and this makes up your shoulder, okay? But this is a flat bone, you can see it's very thin. It does have a ridge. We will talk about the scapula. Um, I have an irregular bone. Um, and this is actually the a thoracic vertebrae of a cow. So if I can show it up close, um, you can have, so these are what are called the transverse processes. Um, and then this is the dorsal process. Um, the whole it's the opening where the spinal cord goes in. And then these, this is an articular process. This connects to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, okay? And then this is what's called the body. But this is irregular because there's this bone and this is another vertebrae, okay? This is actually called the atlas. But you can tell they're both vertebrae, but they're irregular. They don't look the same. Um, now, I don't have a short bone with me, but those are the bones that we would find in the carpus and the tarsus. So they're small, they're short, um, and there's usually multiple um, compacted together. So I do want you to know the different types, and I believe this is an exercise in your lab book. So just to refresh. Um, so again, I do want you to know this picture, but I'm going to talk about next is the bone marrow cavity, which the bone marrow is contained in the medullary cavity. This brown right here is meant to be hollow. So um, here, the medullary cavity is hollow, right? I lost my mouse. Here we go. And then you're going to have right here, this is where we find the bone marrow. Now, there are two types of marrow. I just want you to know what the bone marrow does. Red bone marrow is called hematopoietic. Hamato meaning blood, poetic meaning production of. So red bone marrow produces um, the blood cells. So that's where the blood cells come from. Um, 
young animals have more red bone marrow. As they get older, it converts to something called yellow bone marrow, um, which is primarily adipose, and usually adipose or fat has a yellow color, so that's kind of why they where it got the yellow bone marrow. Um, and it's more common in adults, but in times of great need, it can convert back to red marrow. But all I'm really stressing right now is the bone marrow is in the medullary cavity and it is hematopoietic tissue, meaning it produces blood. So bone marrow relies on, or our blood cells need to come from the bone marrow. Um, now, one thing on a bone, this goes for every bone, and this is an important slide because I'm always stressing you know, like I like to use the femur for this example. This is a femur, but if you look, there are different parts to it, okay? There's, you know, the head, um, there's a groove here, there's a process here, and all of them have a job, okay? Anytime I talk about an articular surface of a bone, and I have people get this wrong and I stress it. An articular surface is a joint surface. So if I say, for example, okay, this is the head of the femur, this is the acetabulum. This would go, this is the hip, and here's where the bone goes, okay? This, and there would be a patella right here, makes up the knee or the stifle. It bends and moves. So what does it do? It articulates with the bone below it, okay? Think of these kind of like rollers down here, okay? This would be in the stifle. This would be surrounded by a joint capsule, and this would be enclosed and would be called the stifle. This would be filled with joint fluid, which is synovial fluid. So the articular surface of a bone has to be found within a joint. If I was to say, this is the shaft of the bone, okay? Here's the shaft. If I said the shaft is the articular surface of the femur, true or false, you would tell me, I think, thank you. I was like, someone say it. <laughs> false, this does not articulate with anything. This is the shaft, which is also known as the diaphysis, okay? This long part, um, just here. The head of the femur is an articular surface because it is in the hip and it moves. I wait, I have a pelvis. It's small. My dog has been trying to get into my little bag of bones here. He's been very desperate, but here is the, the pelvis, okay? Here is the acetabulum. The head of the femur would fit in there and this is how you move your hip, okay? So this is an articular surface, and this is an articular surface because they articulate or move. So you can only find an articular surface within a joint. So if I've only spent about five minutes talking about that, I'd probably find it pretty important. That's a little hint. Okay, if, I am, if I'm a bony process, a process is a lump, a bump, or other projections on a bone, okay? Right up here of the femur, now it's kind of chipped away, and it's maybe hard to see in the picture, but it's kind of like a point. Um, it's been broken a little bit. This is called the greater trochanter of the femur. A lot of times trochanters, it's a term used, and the job of these are to typically have where the tendon from a muscle attaches. So there's all these little bumps and projections. Here's some, there's one right here. There's one on the lateral aspect, and this is where the muscles form into a tendon and attach to a bone. So a process, if I say what is a process, it is a projection on a bone, and that is where the tendon from a muscle attaches to the bone. Now, there may be muscle that covers here, like the shaft or the diaphysis, but the primary point of movement is at these, when the muscles contract, they pull 
these processes and that's how the leg or the forearm move. They, they pull on the process. Now, other things um, on a bone, and it's maybe hard to tell in pictures, there are holes or depressed areas. So I already told you, anytime you hear foramen or foramina, it's a hole in a bone. And that means something comes out of the hole. It could be a nerve, a blood vessel. Um, it's a little bit hard on this picture or this for you to see, but I don't know if you can see those tiny little holes right there, okay? Those are all where the blood supply comes out of the bone. I'm trying to find the main hole on this and it may be a little hard to see on this one. Um, but if it has a foramen, like the nutrient foramina is where the blood supply comes in. Now, a fossa is, um, that's a good question. A sinus is not considered a foramen because a sinus is sealed. A sinus is like a pocket, but it, it, is, it is contained within the skull and it's sealed off, if that makes sense. A foramen will be an opening that allows things in and out. So when your sinuses get full, um, eventually there is a communication um, with like the back of your throat, like if you have post-nasal drip, but a lot of times stuff will get trapped in sinuses. So it doesn't, sinus is like an air-filled cavity in a bone, usually in the skull. A foramen, is, but there's no blood supply or nerve supply that comes out of a sinus, if that answers your question or makes sense. Um, what I wanna show you in this um, scapula, if you can appreciate, is there is a wing, or this is actually called the spine of the scapula, and then there is like a depression, or like you can see there's two sides. Um, a fossa is a depression in a bone. So this is called um, the suprascapular fossa because it's above, and this is the infrascapular fossa, which is below. The supraspinatus um, lies above, that's a muscle, and the infraspinatus muscle lies below. So typically a fossa is where a muscle will, you know, like if you sometimes like, for my dog, He's a boxer, his shoulders are very muscular. Um, if I go to try to feel the spine of the scapula, a lot of times you can palpate a dog if they're skinny or they're a thinner breed, and you can actually feel the spine. But if the dog has very muscular build, these muscles will fill in and you almost cannot feel this. So it's very hard for me to feel this on my dog, but he's a muscular breed. Um, if you also, when dogs start to lose weight or diseases or they become, they have cachexia where they're actually burning um, fat and muscle, a lot of times you can almost grab this whole spine of the scapula. And that means that there are actually, you know, they're missing some muscle tissue in here. Okay. So these are the basic, oh, I'm getting like bony little pieces everywhere. Okay. Um, but this is the fossa, and that's the depression. Um, nice little hole right there, so we can see um, where some of the blood supply comes in. Um, here's, so this is a process. This is called the acrimonium of the scapula, and it's a process, and that's where the muscles will hit. Um, hopefully, Ireland, that answered your question, but um, you can see where some of the bones, where the tendons attach. Here. Okay, so I know I spent a lot of time talking about one slide, but when you look at bones and when you look at the parts of a bone, you need to be familiar with why is there a, like a depression? Why is there a fossa? Why is there a foramen? What is the articular surface? If I didn't mention, usually what these are down here, these are the called the condyles of the femur. To me, I think of them almost like rollers, okay? And if you think about, this would be the tibia, and basically these roll or move with the stifle. Also, this is the 
trochanteric fossa of the femur. This, this is called the trochanter. This is the fossa and the patella sits here, that little round kneecap, your kneecap or that round bone on your knee. Um, in the stifle, that patella rolls in that groove, okay? So as the stifle bends, that little bone fits into this trochanteric fossa, okay? So those, and then the condyles are like the rollers. Um, so we'll move on to, as I talk, we're gonna talk about these bones individually and so I've already kind of mentioned this, but anytime you have an, every bone that is part of a joint has an articular surface. So when I say a joint, it's where two bones come together. So the stifle joint is the femur and the tibia. The shoulder joint is the scapula and the humerus. Okay, so where two bones meet and move, that is the joint. And there is, now there is a layer of what's called articular cartilage or hyaline cartilage. So this has a layer of articular cartilage. Now, let's talk about, let's go back to hip dysplasia for a minute. One of the issues in hip dysplasia is here's the acetabulum, here's the hip, or here's the femur. If they're not stuck together, okay, this bone will can kind of move. And what it'll do is it rubs on the acetabulum. Well, what happens is you can wear away the articular cartilage of this bone or this bone. Now, what that does is it becomes, this starts to erode and it starts to form arthritis. Arth is joint. Itis is inflammation of. So anytime there's abnormal movement in a joint, the consequence is you eat away at articular cartilage and it causes inflammation and pain. That's why dogs with hip dysplasia are so painful because it's that chronic wearing away at the joint. Now, one of the medications, because some of you may have heard of this, um, a lot of times the dogs with hip dysplasia will put them on a drug called Cosequin. There's one called Dasequin, and it's basically glucosamine and chondroitin. You can actually give dogs the human glucosamine and chondroitin. It's the same thing. Cosequin and Dasequin are the veterinary uh, forms of glucosamine and chondroitin. But if you have a big dog on it for life, it can get expensive. So we would tell owners, we're like, just go to Costco or Walmart and get the human form, it's a lot cheaper. But what glucosamine and chondroitin do, there it's called a nutraceutical, it will help rebuild the cartilage. It takes about a good four to six months. Um, I always would have, you know, owners would give it for two days and call us and say, my dog's still limping. And I'm like, it's not, um, doesn't work that way. It takes about a good four to six months. So, you, you know, owners have to be in it for the long haul. But if they give it daily, um, eventually it's going to help rebuild the cartilage and hopefully help. But that's just to give you an example of what is the job of articular cartilage. And when you, and, you know, again, it's supposed to give a coating and protection of when this bone moves in the hips. Now, anytime you hear the word condyle, head or facet that is those are all articular surfaces the head of the femur the condyles of the femur or the facets of the vertebrae now these two don't technically go together okay this is thoracic this is cervical but every vertebrae connect together with something called facets so when you bend your neck and twist your head, they move and are connected together. You don't want these falling apart, okay? So the facets connect and they articulate. So hopefully that makes sense with what I'm talking about. So when you hear head, condyle, facet, those are all articular surfaces. Now, the bone processes is where I've already explained that tendons or muscles attach. So um, these are all names of different processes. These are all official names that you find on the bones. 
the spinous process of a vertebrae. We don't just call this the process, this is called the spinous process, which is usually the dorsal process, okay? Um, if you look in this picture, this is the transverse process of a vertebrae because they go the, they're like the wings. I think of them like the wings. But the job of these wings are, they're basically gonna hold on to the muscles that surround the thorax. So they, they give support, okay? So tendons of thoracic muscles are gonna attach here. Um, tendons are going to attach here, and it's all going to hold it together to give support. Um, the spine of the scapula, this is where a lot of muscles attach and allow you to move your shoulder, okay? They attach to the spine of the scapula, they pull. Um, wings on the atlas, this is the atlas. These are called the wings of the atlas. If you put your, if you go to your dog, okay, behind their ears, right behind their neck, you can feel and palpate typically the wings of the, of the um, atlas, okay? So they're usually very prominent. The dorsal press prominent is not prominent. This dorsal process is very short, but the transverse processes are very wide, okay? So when you hear any of those names, trochanter, tubercle, tuberosity, spine, wing, they're all a process. And the job is a tendon is going to attach to it. Tendons attach to processes and that's how muscles move bones. Um, I've already stressed this. So a foramen, something important is going through that right here. This is called the vertebral foramen. Something real important called the spinal cord goes through that. Now, the job of the vertebrae is to protect that spinal cord, okay? So as long as your back is moving in alignment and um, yeah, it's, it's kind of an important thing. Um, I like the spinal cord and I like it to not hurt and cause problems. But an intact vertebral column is when all the bone vertebrae move together, but you never want them compressing that spinal cord. And then the fossa, is usually occupied by um, muscles or tendons. So a fossa is usually allowing, again, you can all try to find the scapula on your dog, find it up near the shoulder area and see if you can feel this ridge. Again, I don't have very good luck with Bo. Uh, my cat, who's trying to die, and she's, she's doing better this weekend, but she's very old and skinny. You can literally grab her whole scapula and feel every like edge of the bone. You can feel the spine, but that's because her muscles have wasted away from her thyroid disease. And, you know, so now you can feel that fossa. But again, suprascapular fossa is where the suprascapulous muscle lies in infras or supraspinatus muscle lies in the suprascapular fossa infraspinatus muscle lies in the infraspinatus fossa so the names of the muscles fit with the name of the fossa we'll get into that a little bit when we talk about muscles um, okay we break the skeleton into there's little bony fragments all over my desk it's awesome okay um, we break the skeleton up into two, well, there's two main parts. There's the axial skeleton, which is the axis of the body. Um, that is the skull, the spinal column, the ribs come off of the axial skeleton, um, and the sternum. Technically, the tail bones are part of that as well. Now, the appendicular skeleton, um, is considered the limbs or appendages, appendicular appendages. So any bone that's part of the forelimb or the hind limb or the paw is considered an appendicular skeleton. And then visceral skeleton, visceral is meaning tissue or organ. These are bones that are floating bones and there's not very many. Like we talked about, I use the os penis day one and that's in the canine, there is a floating bone 
um, right under the penis. There's a groove for the urethra, okay? But also the hyoid bone. There's a U-shaped bone right under the larynx and it supports, but it's not attached to the vertebrae. It's not attached to the shoulders. Um, now we have a clavicle here. Cats have a little clavicle bone, but dogs don't. Um, but that is connected, so we don't, con that's, I don't want people to get clavicle mixed up with when I'm talking about the hyoid bone, which is under here. Um, let's start with the skull, and actually, I have a skull. Oh, okay, so I have a skull. Uh, I'll talk about it. It's technically made up of 37 to 38 separate pieces. So, I, you know, like when you hold this, it looks like one structure. But again, all those bones had fused together um, with those fibrous joints, which are called sutures. It's kind of maybe hard to tell. I don't know if you can look at that. Well, there's a light that's bright, but there is a line going down the middle of the skull. That is called a suture line. That's where these bones came together and this is that fibrous joint. And remember fibrous joints, a joint, we always think of like stifle and elbow as a joint, but remember a joint is anywhere where two bones come together, if I didn't make that clear. Um, but remember only synovial joints are the freely movable. I will get into that. But this is a fibrous joint. And in the skull, they, cause, they call them suture lines. And they are not movable. Now, the mandible is this bone here. The mandible is the bottom jaw. Now this, okay, well it's kind of, oh, it's wired together so I can't open it. But if you can see this bone right here, this bone, of the mandible moves is a synovial joint and that's how the jaw opens and closes. So your TMJ joint is technically called your temporomandibular joint because the bone is technically the mandible bone comes up in the temporal bone and they call it temporomandibular joint or TMJ joint and that's where and that is synovial. That does move back and forth. <clears throat> So what we're going to talk about here is break them down. So inside the brain cavity, there's the ones you see on the outside, which are the external bones of the cranium. And then there's bones, it's kind of hard to see. Well, it's all really enclosed, but there are internal bones. Um, the bones, the ear has three little bones. Um, and then there are landmark bones and hidden bones. Let me get into a few of the more common, sorry, someone's trying to get in. Um, okay. Okay, so when you look at the external bones here, um, you're gonna see, really it's hard to tell, but the occipital bone is actually back here. Most of the skull bones are pairs, there were two except this occipital bone is only one bone. And this is would make up the back of the skull. What I wanna mention here, and this becomes a common landmark for certain types of procedures that you guys will hear about. There is a little ridge. I don't know if you can see this kind of little spine here, okay? This is the occipital bone. The point of this skull is called the occipital protuberance. Now it is a protuberance because this is where muscles and tendons attach that help control the skull. But basically, here is the atlas, okay? Um, when we go to do a procedure, sometimes the, the doctor will say, okay, go to the occipital protuberance and feel, and then we can actually, this is where my dog had, he had meningitis, and he had a, a CSF tap, and they put the needle right between here. So you had to find his occipital protuberance, and then they went right behind that. So when we talk about occipital protuberance, and most people can feel that on their dogs or their cat, um, unless they, could, they have like a muscly head, um, but that's what this, and it comes from this bone. 
Now, if we look, we've got the intraparietal bones, temporal bones. The temporal bones are actually over here. But if you think about where the ear is in relationship to the skull, temporal bone is by the temple. Frontal bones are here in front. Now, if you can imagine, here's where the eyes go. If you're looking at this skull, here's where the eyes are. Anything really behind the eyes, this is called, this is our frontal bone. Underneath here is our frontal sinus, okay? So everything really from here down, this is only what's protecting our brain. So this is why we're talking about the bones from here back or the cranium. We're not talking about here, okay? So I just really want you to know the occipital bone and the frontal bones. Those are the more common. So I'll type a little thing here. And then if I move forward, Oh, let me, oh, okay, I'm still on the picture. Let me mention something here about the skull right here. This is the skull bones, okay? Um, what's interesting is here's the orbit. So the orbit is where the eye or the globe of the eye fits in. Um, <clears throat> you're gonna notice there's a bone here called the lacrimal bone. Well, right in the corner of your eye is your lacrimal duct. Lac lacrimal duct is found near the lacrimal bone. So I will say a lot of these skull bones are named for structures that are also located in that same area. Frontal sinus, frontal bone. Temples, temporal bone. Lacrimal duct, lacrimal bone. So that hopefully will help maybe people like remember these names. Um, let me mention something here and it's, let me see. Um, this is another important landmark. Um, and it's kind of actually broken in this picture, but there is a piece here oh, that goes up here. Um, here's the orbit, and this is called the zygomatic arch, okay? The zygomatic arch is kind of equivalent to the cheekbone. And, you know, actually, and my poor little cat, keep using her as an example, you can literally like feel her whole zygomatic arch because the muscles, um, has, she's had some muscle wasting. Um, but a lot of dogs, you can kind of feel that. And we will use the zygomatic arch as a landmark for like dental blocks. So if you go into extractions, um, we feel it as a landmark to check for muscle wasting. So it becomes um, an important part. Now, I talked about the occipital bone. I showed you here. You can see on the back, here it is. This little point at the top is literally, that's the occipital protuberance. They don't have it labeled um, here. And then what you'll see here, um, this is an extension of the temporal bone. Then it becomes the zygomatic arch, which is right there. Um, this is the occipital bone. You can see the occipital condyles. Those condyles are articular. That's where the atlas attaches and that's where the, they move together. Foramen magnum. So this is where the brain stem exits. Very important. That's the brain stem connects the spinal cord to the brain. Um, you can see here, they don't have them labeled, but see those two little holes on the side? So that's where more blood vessels and nerves will exit. So not everything comes out of just the foramen magnum. You can see it in this skull. That almost kind of looks like a weird fish with an open mouth right now. I'm just realizing like these are the eyes, but, but here's the foramen magnum. And then these are just different foramen that okay, basically blood supply or nerves will come out of. Um, and then the, art, the atlas articulates. So in these slides, they give you the names of everything and then they show you a close-up picture of what, they call, what they're called. Um, the parietal bones are located much further back. Um, so that one's not as important. I'm gonna just, for time's sake, um, but I'm not gonna get into those 
Um, the temporal bones, um, they're ventral. So you've got the parietal bones are up here. Interparietal and parietal are here. Temporal is down like lower, like right about kind of like back here behind your ear. Um, but they contain the middle and ear, inner ear structures are inside the temporal bones. Um, and this is where the TMJ joint forms. So right here, okay, you're going to have a temporal bone here, and then you're going to have the beginning of where your mandible comes under, and that forms the TMJ, temporomandibular joint. What you'll find, a lot of names for joints have the names of both bones. Temporomandibular joint is the temporal mandible bone. Coxofemoral joint is in the hip, and that's the femur, and the oscoxae, which is part of the hip. Um, so a lot of different joints have the names of both the bones that are located um, in there. And if I move on, um, the frontal bones, and so this is like the forehead right here. So we're not talking about down here, we're talking about up here. Um, and it's part of the socket. So here's the frontal bone, and part of that frontal bone forms part of that eye socket. Um, if you have a horned breed of cattle, like a Texas longhorn, those big, you know, get the big horns, this is where the horn buds would be located. So if they are a polled breed or have horns, you would find the horn buds right here in the frontal bone. That's why technically, the, the core of the horn is hollow and it communicates with the frontal sinus. So there is a frontal sinus here, but if you've ever had a sinus headache and you've ever been like, oh my God, my head hurts right here, it's because these sinuses are like bony pockets. Um, and when they get filled with mucus, they do not stretch, okay, they're bone, but it does put pressure. And so pressure can build up very quickly. And that's why sometimes your eyes hurt because part of the frontal sinus is right behind your eyes. And if that makes sense. Um, now, one bone that I do, let me get to the next picture because it just shows this up close. Um, here's your frontal bone. I want you to know the maxilla is the top jaw, uh, top jaw and the mandible is the bottom. So you need to know the maxilla and the mandible. Um, you've got the zygomatic arch. They call it the zygomatic bone, but it, it forms an arch. So a lot of people call it the zygomatic arch. And then you've got this occipital bone back here. And you can see, you can't, it's hard to see in this picture, but here's the mandible. It's going up under the zygomatic arch and here's the temporal bone. That's why they call it the TMJ joint. And that's where the mandible opens and closes when you when there's chewing. Um, I will only mention one thing about this, and this is kind of hard to see. These are internal bones. So inside the skull, there is an inner bone, inner bone, and the one I want to talk about is the ethmoid bone. Okay. And the ethmoid bone separates the brain from the nasal cavity. So right here, you have nasal sinuses. There would be a plate internal here, and it forms something called the cribriform plate. The cribriform plate, um, there is an olfactory nerve that goes through that plate to the brain. So when an animal smells, it'll allow the brain to detect the smell. Um, this big this became significant for me because unfortunately um when my do, my old dog was about eight and a half ish um he had a seizure and then he had two more and they started coming more frequently um and i had him had an he had an mri at bca and they found that he had a nasal tumor but what happened was his nasal tumor was really far back in his nasal cavity and the tumor was eating away at that cribriform plate. So what happened was the tumor was pushing on his brain. Now normally that cribriform plate 
protects anything that's in the nasal cavity from penetrating the brain. So it's supposed to be protective. But again, unfortunately, in his case, um, that's why he was having seizure activity. It wasn't a brain tumor. It was technically the nasal tumor was pushing into the brain. But again, an intact cribriform plate um, shouldn't allow that to happen. But cancer's stupid, so. Okay, um, we, you guys get into sinuses and kind of things like that later, but there are three bones within the ear. Um, they're the gamalus, incus, and stapes, which incus, and they call it hammer, anvil, and stirrup. Um, but technically what they do is they will take vibrations from the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane separates the outer from the middle ear. So when vibrations come in and they, pro they go across that tympanic membrane, they will cause a vibration and that will get sent to the cochlea, which is very internal, and then that will send the vibrations to the inner ear and send an impulse. So there are little bones called ossicles um, that will actually be part of the ear. Um, now for what I wanna mention about landmark bones, okay? These are external bones, and this is the ones we talk about that are usually, um, if we talk about from the eyes, and we talk about down, okay? So this is typically like the bones of the nose area. Um, incisive bone is right up here, but the incisive bone contains the incisors. The incisors are the front teeth that we see. So the incisive bone houses the incisors. The nasal bones are right up here and they're the most, they're the bones that we see on top. So there's a pair of nasal bones. Now, you may get into this when you talk about breeds, but if you've ever heard of, sometimes we call breeds brachycephalic. Brachycephalics are any of the short nosed breeds, English Bulldog, Pugs, Boston Terrier, um, Frenchies, but they basically have the really short snout. And it means they have their skull, the frontal or the nasal bones are very short. Now, it basically, it's like they took this skull and they ran into a wall. So, um, and it creates challenges for a brachycephalic because basically, if you look inside and you can kind of see, no, oh, let me get a better, I don't know if you can see. Oh, it's kind of hard. Um, oh, maybe like that. Okay. Inside, there's all these little, I'm going to talk about, these are called turbinates. There's like circular um, little tunnels and holes and structures. When an animal inhales, okay, through their nose, it basically goes through all these turbinates. We talk about it more when we do the respiratory system next term. Um, when you have a brachycephalic, that's all shortened. So this is where we get the breathing difficulty or why if they have strenuous exercise or on a hot day, they can't cool themselves. They're much more prone to heat stroke because they don't have that length and nasal cavity to cool, filter, and humidify the air because everything is kind of smushed. Now, let me go to the complete opposite. You have a greyhound or a German shepherd. They are considered what's called dolciocephalic, and they have the very long snout. So dolciocephalic breeds, whippet, greyhound, German shepherd, borzoi, um, basically has the very, very long snout. There's one not on here, I'll type it in, which is called mesocephalic. Now that would be like a mesocephalic. Cockers, Beagles, Brittany. It, I think of it like cars, okay? A brachycephalic is like your, uh, Oh, smart car, okay? You might have a mesocephalic is like your 
little sedan, like, um, yeah, I'm really blanking on cars here. And then obviously your really long Cadillacs and things like that, or your Dolchiocephalics. So if we're talking about length, you've got Dolchiocephalics, you've got a Mesocephalic, which is your mid-sized snout, and then you're going to have your shorts, which are your brachycephalics. So really that pertains when we talk about canines. Cats, for the most part, have a pretty, um, you know, I like my analogy, Sean. <laughs> so yeah, I get into my mid-size cars. You've got your like big SUVs, your mid-size, and then your little compact cars when you go to rent a car. Think of it that way. Um, but what you, um, cats, even though you've got big cats and little cats, um, you know, you have some brachycephalic cats, you know, like your, um, wow, somebody give me a short cat breed. My coffee has not kicked in. I keep wanting to say Pekingese. Persian. Thank you. You have those little Persians there look like, you know, they're really, really short. Um, gosh, there's another one. As soon as I get off this call with you guys, I'll totally think of it. But so there are some cats, but it, it's just a little more rare. The dogs have a very wide variety of snout size. Cats, you pretty much are like brachycephalic and normal. They don't really have like a dolciocephalic. So most of the time when we talk about brachy, dolci, mezzo, we're really pertaining to the dog. Um, and then again, you use brachycephalic for some cats, um, not as much. Himalayans, yes. I literally don't know what's wrong with my brain this morning. It totally went. Um, but here's what I was talking about. I was trying to show you inside. If you took off the snout, okay, we cut off here and we look into the nasal cavity, these are the turbinates. Okay, so they look like turbines, or think about like a wind turbine, all right? Um, they are made up of some turbinates. The nasal turbinates are in the nasal cavity under, under those nasal bones. Um, they are to cool the air, and they are called nasal conche. Conche comes from, if you think about the conch shell, if you like, you know, you talk, you listen at the beach and you can supposedly hear the ocean. Conch shell is for that turn in the shell. So nasal conche are the turbinates. That's the only one I want you to be familiar with in the hidden bones of the nasal cavity, okay, um, is the turbinates. So I'm not going to, the palatine, pertigoid, vomer, all I want you to know is what a turbinate is and what its job is. And it's basically to cool. So if you can imagine the brachycephalics and that being smushy, they're going to have a much smaller turbinate and you're not going to have as much surface area to cool the air. That's why literally the first night's day that's hot, you have all these bulldogs coming into the emergency room because they got overheated really, really fast because they cannot cool the air as efficiently. Um, now the hyoid bone is this floating bone. It basically helps support the larynx, which the larynx is our voice box. We do that in respiratory, but it basically helps support and um, there's, it's a U-shaped bone, it's bone and cartilage, but again, it's not connected. Um, it's basically kind of like considered almost a floating bone. Okay, now this is an interesting picture because this is literally, you put, they put all the names of the bones in where they go. Though they wrote, and to me, I would try to practice on the study guide I sent you. It gave you a list of bones to know, and basically these are all on there. So if, but you also need to know which are bones of the forelimb. So if you start, now obviously the axial skeleton I'll just go through is made up of skull, cervical vertebrae, the scapula is actually a forelimb bone, but it attaches to the outside of the thorax. So you have cervical, cervical vertebrae, thoracic vertebrae, lumbar vertebrae. You have the sacrum, and then the coccygeal vertebrae are the bones in the tail. The ribs are attached to the axial skeleton. 
the bones of the appendicular skeleton, the forelimb is the scapula, humerus, radius and ulna. You've got the carpus, the metacarpals, and the phalanges. These are the metacarpals. These are the phalanges. On the back leg, you have the pelvis, which is made up of different bones. So we call it a pelvis, but I will tell you the bones that make up the pelvis. You also have a femur, a tibia and a fibula, tarsus, metatarsals, and phalanges. So you got metacarpal in the front, tarsal in the back, C comes before T, okay? So carpus is always forelimb, tarsus is always hind limb. Um, this will be a challenge, but this picture, I have always had this on the bone test for you to label. Now, I don't always have every bone, but I tell you, you're responsible for every bone. If you have not gone to that Purpose Game website, there is an excellent dog skeleton, and you can literally play it over and over again, and it'll quiz you. Um, I can always try to send you the link, and maybe in our lecture tomorrow, I can actually pull up the link and show you. But it's very beneficial um, to quiz yourself. Or um, there is blank versions of skeletons. I don't know if everybody has access to printing where you can print this off. Um, or you can literally, if you know the names, you know the order where to put them in. And then when you see the image, so here we've got cervical vertebrae, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, coccygeal, scapula, radius, I'm sorry, humerus, radius, ulna, metacarpals, ribs, pelvis, femur, tib, fib, tarsal bones. We'll talk about the olecranon and the calcaneus because those are projections. We use those names a lot because those are very important. The bump on the back of your elbow here, I cracked this into the wall last night and it, it, it hurt so bad this morning, but it was dark and I literally ran into the edge of the wall. But this point that you feel when you bend your elbow, this is the olecranon. Sometimes people call it olecranon. It's kind of like tomato, tomato. I call it olecranon. If you called it olecranon, you know, but it is a very important point for muscle attachment, but it is the point of the elbow, just like back here, the calcaneus is the point of the hock, and this is where the Achilles tendon, the Achilles tendon attaches here. And so we're gonna go through these bones, but I wanted to show, now basically, the only one thing I wanna mention, we're almost done, um, is that there is a horse skeleton. I, I'm gonna work off the dog skeleton, but when I get to the distal limb, we're gonna work through all the bones. The, this bone in the horse has different names. One of your lab exercises um, goes over the leg, the equine leg, label the forelimb and the hind limb. Again, it's same as the dog until you get down to about here. Then this is where things start to look a little different and we will get into that. But basically everything kind of up here, um, right to about midway here, is about the same in a dog. So I'm gonna stop there. I'll, does anybody have any questions? Um, I can unmute people for a moment, unless you wanna keep yourself muted. That's totally fine. Sean, I have a question. Did you send us this PowerPoint and I lost it in all my emails? Um, you know, hang on, my speaker is really low. I can, I can, you know, I can shoot it out again. I thought I sent it. Maybe did anybody, anyone get it? I would just, cause I'll go back and I'll print that one screen with all the bones on it, like you were talking about. And I was, I see the email where it says our reading is the bones and our homework and all attached to it is the study guide. There was an email before that because okay. I sent the homework separately from the PowerPoint. So I sent the PowerPoint first and then I sent the homework. Okay, um, then I, sh I should be able to find it then. If I you just didn't save it. No, no, you're fine. I mean, 
if anyone doesn't have the PowerPoint, email me and I can resend it out. Um, it would be beneficial if you have, there is a way for you to print one slide and make it like full screen. Normally, right. I would give, normally I would give you these pictures as a handout separately, um, but you can literally go into print and it'll tell you, you can say print slides and you can put in which slides you want to print and it will print. Right. The whole, yeah. Just if there's anyone else listening and they would rather have um, a print, printed copy. Um, best feedback and new material. Maybe that's the one it's in. That should be it. It is. I got it. Okay, that was good. my only question. No, <laughs> it, no, it's good to talk it out because all my classes are blending together. So I'm literally like every day going, did I do that? Did I? I so keep me it's honest. Okay. So we're all. <laughs> <laughs> what i said all of our classes are blending together too oh i can imagine yeah, they are I, well yeah i mean hopefully you guys someone posted and i don't it was in a different group i think they made like a chart and literally wrote they had to write like which days what things are due and um you know they had different boxes for different days and oh. um that's what I've been doing with the, remember when we first started